Hello YouTube, how's everyone doing? It's Professional here. So today I have a really cool lore video for you guys on GTA San Andreas. And if you like videos like this, please do drop a like because it does help me to make more lore content. But on this video, we're going to be talking about why does Salvatore not do any anything to CJ? So CJ betrayed Salvatore. He screwed him over. He robbed the casino. Salvatore even threatens to kill him in a phone call after the casino heist. But he does nothing. Why exactly? I've had a lot of people that have actually asked me this question. So here I'm going to be explaining this. Hope that you guys enjoy this video. But before we start the video, I'd like to thank today's sponsor. Is your browser slow and boring, just like this post-op cell mission? Then check out Opera GX. Opera GX is a new browser that I started using, and it's the most fun browser ever used. But not only that, it has the most customization in a browser I've ever used. When you start using this browser, you'll realize just how boring your old browser was. For example, if we go in the mods section, this gives us different mods that we can install. And there's so many on the store. And we have, you know, options on here, web modding, shaders, theme, background music, browser sounds, wallpaper. Let's go on the store right here. I'm going to show you guys a lot of the different options. And we are going to install Drive-By. Drive-By is kind of a crime-themed uh, mod. And I play a lot of crime games on this channel. So let's install it right here. Only takes a few seconds. And there we go. It is installed just like that. And so you guys see theme right here. All this is on here. And so when you install a mod, you will see a different background that's unique to that mod. But also different sound effects. So when you're hovering over things, different sounds for that. Click around. And also, even when you type, when you type, it's specific to that to that mod. Take a listen to this. So let me show you guys this. There are so many games and different types of mods they have on here. So take a look at this, guys. I searched Grand Theft Auto, and they have so many different mods on here for your browser. So your chances are your favorite game probably already has a mod for that, too. But right here, we got GTA San Andreas, Vice City, GTA 5, GTA 4, and GTA 3. Let's take a look at GTA 4. That's my favorite GTA. Install. And just like that, it is installed. And that is that theme that is actually playing right there, that is actually the Soviet connection, the GTA 4 theme. And we got Nico background. When we click around, we actually hear di the different menu sounds for GTA 4, and also when we type. You can disable and remove these mods anytime from the, from the mod menu, and you can also change them just by going up and down here. If you don't want to use a mod, you have different themes that you can also choose up here. And what I really appreciate about this browser is that it actually has a dark mode. I just hate it when I'm browsing my computer late at night, working on a lore video like for this one, and the screen is just so bright. So I appreciate Opera GX having a, a dark mode in that. And also on top of that, we can change the music right here. So if you're not using a theme, there's a few different tracks that you can actually choose from right here. And these are all tracks that are just right that are right in the browser itself. And if you want to mute it at any time, you can also just hit this bottom left button here to mute music. So we got the San Andreas mod installed right now. I also wanted to show you guys this GX control. So GX control, what's really cool about this is that when you're in here, you can actually control the amount of RAM that your browser has. Control RAM and CPU, and this is especially helpful if you're playing a game on the PC and you still want to have your browser open in the background and you don't want it to lag your game. It's great for that. But Opera GX gets even better, because if we click on this top left corner here, we go to the GX corner. And in here, we can see a lot of different games that are actually coming out, and Opera GX will actually notify you about special deals across all systems. All systems, Xbox, Series X, PS5, it'll tell you about Steam deals, Epic game deals, and it gives you a release calendar. And I find this very helpful because I can keep track of what games are releasing. There's actually a few games I'm actually looking forward to on here. Thief Simulator 2, looking forward to that one. And I'm also looking forward to Assassin's Creed Mirage, right here. And you can just click right on the page. It'll take you to the website or the Steam page, the PlayStation page and give you information about the game, its release date, and oftentimes lets you pre-order it from here as well. 
And additionally, it will also tell you about free-to-play games that are available across all the different systems and free games that you can actually download at the moment. This would be Xbox Game Pass, PS Plus, on Steam, or on the Epic Game Store. You can also scroll down here and choose the different stores if you just want to go to a specific one. If you have a lot of passwords saved in another browser, a lot of things that you have saved, history, passwords, and you're worried about all the effort that it'll take to bring that over, don't worry also, because you can go into the settings page, and when you go to the settings page, you just scroll right down here to synchronization. And you import bookmarks and settings, and you choose from your browser, from Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Internet Explorer, and you just bring everything over from that browser. I brought everything over from Chrome, into Opera GX. I was very surprised by how fast and easy it was. And additionally, in the settings, if we go into the sidebar here, we can also link our social medias, and we can link streaming services like Twitch directly to Opera GX. So you guys see, I've linked my Twitter, and I've linked my Discord. And it's all just in one browser. Let's click right here, and my Twitter opens just like that. So stop torturing yourself with just boring browsers. Download Opera GX for free. Check out my link down below in the description and the top pinned comment. So this is the infamous phone call that you actually get from Salvatore at the end of the casino heist. Sup? You two-bit backstabbing piece of eggplant shit! Salvatore! Nice to hear from you too! You're dead! Your friends are dead! Your family's dead! I'm gonna fuck you up and your children and your grandchildren. Well, it's been nice talking to you, but uh, I got some money that needs spending on some expensive trash, so if you excuse me. You're dead! Dead! So if you've played San Andreas for the very first time, after you got that phone call, you're worried, what's gonna happen next? Are hitmen gonna come after you? Is Salvatore gonna do something specifically bad to you? Because he's the most powerful mafia boss in all of America at the time of San Andreas in 1992. So why doesn't Salvatore do anything? He doesn't do anything. He never sends guys after CJ, and he's never heard from again. We know Salvatore is still the most powerful mafia boss in Liberty City nine years later in GTA 3, and in Liberty City stories in 1998. He wins a war against the Ferrellis, the Sindacos, the Yakuza, the Diablos, and the Sicilian Mafia. So if he is this powerful, why doesn't he try to kill CJ for betraying him? This is a question that you might have wanted the answer to, but never thought about asking it. So to understand this, we have to talk about Salvatore's plan, and just how badly CJ screwed him over. This is revealed in the GTA San Andreas introduction. In the GTA San Andreas introduction, we see what happens in Liberty City. This is part of a 20 minute cutscene, which explains the backstory of a lot of the GTA San Andreas characters. This takes place a few weeks before CJ arrives back in Los Santos for his mother's funeral. Let's start with Johnny Sendako wanting Salvatore to invest in Caligula's casino. So, Johnny, you want five million dollars of my money? I want to help you make a fortune, Mr. Leone. My father wants to unite our organizations. The Sendakos and the Leones? That's impossible. That's been impossible since your associates whacked my cousin. Hey, you know me. Business is business. The personal stuff is nonsense. I'd like to see a way past this bullshit. Now, where were we? Ah, uh, you was, uh, seeing a way past this. No, I was saying I'd like to, and you were asking me for five million dollars. So, so let me understand it. I go in your casino, take a third stake along with your organization and the Corellis, then I let you guys manage my investment for me? Bingo. Yeah. Yeah, you must really think my mother, God rest her soul, fucked an idiot instead of my father. Are you calling my mother an idiot who goes with morons? No, of course not, Mr. Leone. <laughs> I'm only making an offer. Clearly, I misinterpreted your intentions here. Look, I humbly apologize. Forgive Sit me. down or I'll slit your throat myself. You luck sucker. Ever since Sonny Ferrelli got himself pasted all over Florida, you think you run things in this town. You show me no respect, you insult my family. Your father, he ain't fit to wipe my ass. I'd fuck an elephant before I'd fuck your mother. How does that feel? Mr. Leone, I think you're just misunderstanding. Hey, you're a good kid. Me? I'm just an old fool. What do I know? Nothing, really. Actually, less than nothing. You can have the money. We can? If you give me control of the books. Yeah, you see, we, we can't do that, Mr. Leone. Then I meant it. Your mother's a fucking transvestite. I got an idea. What about a third party? An 
independent guy. He runs the place, and together we run him. Well, we can't do that, Mr. Leone. We, we got our guy in there already. Get rid of him. Show me exactly how much you want my organization's involvement. Caligula's Casino, also known as Caligula's Palace, is the largest casino in Las Venturas, and it's owned by the Sindaco family. So if, this, if the Sindacos own the largest casino in Las Venturas, a money-making machine, why are they going to both the Leones and the Pirellis looking for a partnership? Do they want to put their differences aside? No, it's because they have no choice. Here's the thing about the Sindacos. They are the weakest family in Liberty City. They hate the fact that they are going to the Leones and the Ferellis, but they need quick cash to fund the casino. They aren't going to get a loan because then it would be much easier for the government to track their dirty money. Mafias use casinos as a front, and it's very easy to hide dirty cash in them for tax reasons. That's why the Sindacos go to the other families for cash. Now, why was it so easy for Johnny to convince the Ferellis to invest in Caligula's, but much harder to convince the Leones? It's because the Ferellis are desperate for cash at this point, because they have been hit really bad. Remember what Salvatore says about the Ferrellis. Ever since Sonny Ferrelli got himself pasted all over Florida, you think you run things in this town. You show me no respect, you insult my family. What Salvatore is talking about is what happened to the Ferrellis in Vice City. Sonny Ferrelli at the start of GTA Vice City decides to go into the drug trade. We've been talking about expanding down south, right? Vice City is 24 karat gold these days. The Colombians, the Mexicans, help. Even those Cuban refugees are cutting themselves a piece of some nice action. But it's all drugs, Sonny. None of the families will touch that shit. Times are changing. The families can't keep the backs turned while our enemies reap the rewards. So, we send someone down to do the dirty work for us and cut ourselves a nice quiet slice, okay? Now, in 1986, the Ferrellis are the strongest mafia in all of America, not the Leones. They decide to go into the cocaine trade, but it ends in a disaster. First, their deal gets ruined by Ricardo Diaz, and later on, Tommy Versetti, the man who was betrayed by the Ferrellis years ago, has his revenge on them. You took 15 years from me, Sonny, and now I'm gonna make you pay! You still don't get it, do you? I own you, Tommy! Those 15 years were mine to spend. Get him, boys, he never understood a thing. This is what Salvatore means when he says Sonny Ferrelli got splattered all over Florida. But let's take a look at the Ferrelli crime family tree right here. I made this. This is also based on the actual real-life um, Italian mafia ranks. So the mafia families, they actually do have their own ranking system. Now let's start at the bottom there. Associates are people who associate with the mafia. Now an associate, are, they are not full members of the mafia. However, though, they could be high-level associates or they could be low-level associates. A low-level associate might be an example of some, you know, street thugs that the Mafia hire to, like, you know, beat somebody up, threaten them, eventually hoping they become made men. But a higher-level associate might be somebody who owns, like, a chop shop but is not necessarily Italian. Because to be a made man of the Mafia, you have to be 100% Italian or at least mostly Italian. Now, Merrill Hull was actually elected mayor of Liberty City in 1992, and he is a puppet mayor. For the Ferellis. He makes sure that the police do not investigate the Ferellis, basically tips off the Ferellis of any kind of police operations, things like that, and he goes after the Leones in 1998 in Liberty City Stories. Uh, then you have Barry. Now, Barry was Phil Collins' manager. He ended up borrowing money from uh, Giorgio Ferrelli, who's most likely the consigliere of the Ferrelli family, didn't want to pay it back, and so the Ferrellis tried to have Phil Collins killed. That was one of the ma major plot points in Vice City Stories. And we have Ken Rosenberg, who's an ex-associate. Ken Rosenberg was a lawyer, but he was mostly as the Ferrelli's contact down in Vice City. He was the guy who would tell them about things that was going on in Vice City. Now, for made men, we got soldiers. Now, soldiers, even though it's the lowest rank in the Mafia, they are full members of the Mafia. And if somebody kills a made man, even if it's a soldier, the Mafia is never going to stop coming after you. They're going to keep coming after you forever. Now, the made men that we have for soldiers, we have Harry and Lee. Now, Harry and Lee are basically two guys who went with Tommy to that deal. You know, the Mafia, the Ferrellis, are not going to send for a giant deal like that. They're going to make sure to send made men. And we have Tommy. Now, Tommy was a soldier uh, in the Ferrelli family before he actually got sentenced to prison. 
Sonny Ferrelli actually betrayed him. I have a whole video on this and how Sonny Ferrelli actually betrayed Tommy. I will have that um, uh, linked at the end if you guys do want to check, check it out. Um, but anyways, then we have Capos. Now, a Capo regime is a captain. Uh, a captain usually runs a specific part of the Mafia's organization. They might run, you know, an illegal casino. Maybe they'll run, like, you know, Mafia's prostitution, Mafia's drugs. They're usually uh, uh, people that run a specific part of the Mafia's operations. They make sure that operation gets as much money as possible, and they make sure to give the boss a cut. Not giving the boss a cut means you're dead. Um, so for the Capos, we got Mike Forelli. Mike Forelli, um, he was in GTA 3. He got killed by a car bomb by Claude um, when he didn't pay back Joey Leon Leone. Um, the, the, we have the unknown Capo. He's the guy who actually sits sits with Sonny at the beginning of the game, the blonde-haired guy. He's never given a name. He dies at the end of Vice City. Um, we have Franco Forelli. Now, Franco Forelli, there's no um, a picture for him, but he's one of the antagonists in Liberty City stories. Franco Forelli is most likely killed by the bombs in 1998 when Fort Staunton is destroyed. Now, for underboss, you know, we had uh, Marco Forelli. Now, Marco Forelli was the underboss at the time of GTA Vice City. He is also Sonny Ferrelli's younger brother. Um, underboss is basically second in command of the mafia. Um, they are there to, uh, you know, make sure whatever the boss says, the underboss, you know, goes to the capos, make sure that what the boss says is going through. And the underboss can take over as the boss if the boss dies, goes to prison, or is in some kind of business meeting or sick. Then the, uh, then the underboss becomes acting boss in that case. And so he's actually killed by CJ in 1992 when he actually goes in the St. Mark's Bistro, which I'll talk about. Um, now, Sonny, we have him as the boss. The boss is basically runs the entire thing, keeps everything together, and whatever the boss says goes. Uh, he's killed at the end of GTA Vice City. And then for Giorgio Forelli, uh, Giorgio Forelli, we have no photos, but uh, judging by the fact that he borrowed money to Barry, um, and he has that and access to a huge army of hitmen. He's related directly to Sonny. And the fact that he also has enough power to actually find out where the jury members are for his trial in Vice City and sends, you know, and contacts Rosenberg. Rosenberg sends Tommy over. Judging by all that, I would say he's probably a consigliere. Consigliere is somebody who gives um, advice to the Don. It's basically an advisor. And a consigliere is somebody who's not really fit to be a leadership position, but somebody who's typically good at giving advice. And a consigliere is only going to be somebody the boss truly trusts, like a really good friend, best friend, or a very close family member. Uh, but that basically explains it. The point that I'm making when I'm explaining this whole thing is the Ferrelli family was a very massive family. They're the only gang that actually appears in every single 3D GTA game. But the Ferrellis by GTA San Andreas are a shell of their former selves. They're starting to collapse. They're not as big and powerful as they used to be. The point in all of this is that after Sonny Ferrelli's death in 1986, everything went downhill for the Ferrellis. They are no longer the most powerful family in Liberty City, but it's now the Leones. It's now their time. It wasn't easy enough to convince them to invest in the casino. But why is it harder to convince the Leones? It's because Salvatore knows he has the cards. He knows that the Sindacos can't accomplish this without him. Salvatore demands control of the books. This means controls of the accounts. He would be able to see where the money is going and who is putting the money there. This would allow him allow him to manipulate it or possibly blackmail the Sindacos. Salvatore's negotiation skills are genius here. He starts with a very unreasonable offer that he knows Johnny will reject. Then he goes in with a more reasonable offer, downing it down, to place a third party running the casino. By doing so, he tones down his offer, and if Johnny refused this, he would just say, I already lowered my offer from the books to a third party. We can all control. This would give me confidence in investing with you. When Johnny hesitates, he tells him that they already have their guy in. Salvatore tells him to get rid of him. We can see another scene in the introduction in which Mickey, the guy running Caligulus, is whacked by two Sindaco members. Hey, how's your woman? <sighs> She's a ball buster. Ever since we moved to Ventura's, all she wants to do, spend, spend, spend. For Christ's sakes, I got better luck on the tables. Yeah, I hear you. Hey, give me a hand with this guy, will you? Yeah. Whew. Whew. I mean, why do we whack Mickey anyhow? He was a stand-up guy. Well, I don't know. Something about money. Oh, man. What? He was on the take? Nah, he was kosher. A little too kosher. That's why he had to go. Oh, I get it. Yeah, he was declaring too much money. So we gotta get a new guy in. You know, I hear the Leones are lending the bosses some money. The Leones? Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. We hate the Leones. I know. That's why I said to Johnny. We said they needed the money. 
on a note that they're ball. So, Mickey gets capped, so we get a new guy in, who everybody bullies. Then, when he misbehaves... Yeah, we dig another hole. Exactly. Hey, you hear about Bobby back east? No, what? He's gone queer. Can you believe that shit? Oh, mother of Christ almighty, I've seen everything. Me and you. <laughs> now, why was Mickey killed exactly? Couldn't they have just replaced him? He was the guy running their casino. It's because Mickey didn't do anything wrong, but because he simply knows too much. Mickey knows about the whole operation of the casino. He knows about its finances, its losses, its weaknesses, and its connections. If the Ferrellis or Leonis or the police get their hands on him, they could really hurt the Sindaco family. That's why they got rid of him, because they can't risk him talking. It's possible that Mickey is not a made man, because a made man is a full member of the mafia. Boss just can't kill a made man, even in his own family, unless that made man did something to hurt the family. This includes snitching, stealing from the boss, or going against the boss. However, it's not unheard of that the mafia to break its own rules. Also, about this scene, that comment about Bobby is also meant to point out how ridiculous the mafia's mor morals are. It's entirely possible that Bobby comment was actually based on The Sopranos. In May of 2004, The Sopranos, a mafia TV show, was at its height. It's discovered that Vito, a captain in the Soprano family, is gay, and he threatens many people to keep this a secret. It's eventually made public in an episode in 2006, but GTA San Andreas was released in October of 2004, half a year after the episode revealing Vito's secret. The point here is that the Mafia are very hypocritical. They just murdered a man who was loyal to them and did no harm to them. One of the mobsters does the sign of the cross, a blessing in Christianity after hearing that Bobby is gay. They don't care about the fact that they just killed a man, they think that's okay, but that's someone being gay is the worst thing ever. It's meant to show how scum the Mafia is, how bad these guys are. Now after Johnny tells Salvatore they, they got rid of him, Salvatore tells him about who he wants to replace Mickey. So we got a vacancy. We kept our end of the bargain. Then I guess we're on. You want something to drink? No, no, I'm good, thank you. So, who's gonna run this casino for us? Hey, we're gonna need a real idiot. A guy we can all push around. There's this lawyer used to work for the Ferrellis down in Florida. I heard he's uh, sniffing around for a job. Just got out of rehab or something. Yeah, that'll work. I'll make a call. Great. Hey, don't fuck this up, kid. So why did Salvatore choose Ken Rosenberg exactly? What's the reasoning behind this? It's because Ken Rosenberg was seen as a pushover by all the families. He was pushed around by the Farrellis in Vice City and later by Tommy. Ken was very smart and really good at hiding illegal money, but he also was really scared. This worked for the families because they could intimidate him into doing whatever they wanted. But there is a big difference between how the three families treated Rosenberg and how the Versetti gang led by Tommy Versetti treated him. While Tommy pushed Ken around, he still saw him as a friend and would never have screwed him over. The three families always saw Ken as disposable, though. This is why Tommy sends Ken to San Andreas for rehab. He sends him far away from Vice City so he can't come back and also because Ken was slipping. His coke addiction was going to cause him to make a mistake eventually and screw the Versetti gang over. Tommy, in his last act of kindness towards Rosenberg paid for his rehab and exiled him, cutting contact. It was that or kill him. I posted a whole lore video on this and why Tommy didn't help Rosenberg in GTA San Andreas. I will link that at the end of the video if anyone wants to watch that. Now, Rosenberg has been disbarred from law. This means he can't practice law nor be a lawyer anymore. When he gets cleaned up, he's desperately looking for a job, so he will take anything. However, once Salvatore gets him in, he makes it clear what his true intentions were. Are you enjoying yourself, huh? Uh, no, I just, you know, just getting a feel for the place. So this is hey. the way it is. You're sitting here already having a good time. Me, five million in a hole to the Sindacos, and you not doing a thing about it? Huh? No, not at all. I, I spoke with Johnny. He oh, you everything. spoke with Johnny. Yeah, he came by, told me you were partners You spoke now. with him, huh? Yeah. Did you suck him off as well, you little fucking weasel? You're my man, not his. I got a good mind to end this here and now, you Jews. Come on, sir, you please. Rat. I thought that was the job. Oh, you thought that was the job? Mike, get the door. I'm the job. Me and my money. And I want it back, and I want it back fast. Johnny fucking Sindaco even so much as blinks at you, I want to hear about it. You find a way to give me my money, and fast. Understood? Yes, yes, understood. Understood. And cheer up. Have some fun around here. This is supposed to be a casino, not a monastery. Christ, I've had more fun taking a crap than I've had here. Come on, go get me a drink. 
Smile, schmuck. Salvatore never planned for Rosenberg to be a neutral third party, but to be his man instead. He was going to screw the Sindacos and the Farellis over. Now we begin the story of San Andreas. The triads expand into Las Venturas with the Four Dragons Casino. However, it's not very long until they start getting attacked and harassed by the Mafia families on the Strip. They are told about a guy who was smashing their slot machines. But CJ sets a time with the hood of the car to get some more information out of him. Supposed to be opening it! What the fuck was that? Hello? Hello? <clears throat> what the fuck is wrong with you people? Boss, CJ's here. Carl, glad you can make it. So, this what you've been doing? Yeah, it's been a complete nightmare. You want a stomach ulcer? Try opening a triad casino in a mafia-run town. The mob trying to squeeze you? Yeah, the corporations are moving in and everybody's feeling the squeeze. I've had slot machines busted up, workmen being scared off. So who behind this? Huh? Well, there are these three mob families operating here, and each of them has a stake in Caligula's casino. And some whacked-out lawyers running it for them. It could be any one of them. Or all of them. Can't you just give them a little something? No. In addition to the usual authorities that need bribing, each one would want a slice. And I'm not about to hand over all our profits to some wise guy Italians. Our profit? That's right, you heard me. I want to offer you a share in our casino. In exchange for some help setting it up. How's that sound, partner? Sound like we got a deal then. Boss! The boys found some thugs trying to smash one of the deliveries. We caught one of them. Get rid of him. Hey, wait. Hold up, hold up. Come here. Whoever's behind this, we need to let them know that they're dealing with full-fledged psychos. <laughs> Time to the front of the car, then you sweat it out a little, and I'll be out there in a little while. See if we can make this guy squeal. That's my car. Now this turns out to be Johnny Sindaco, who CJ nearly scares to death. Hey, hey, who the fuck? Who are you? One time, huh? You know what? I think we're gonna take a little drive. What are you fucking stupid? I'm not joking here. Untie me, motherfucker. Nah, I think I'm gonna leave you right where you are. You got any idea in that pea brain head of yours who the fuck I am? Nah, <laughs> but I think I'm gonna find out. Oh man, this is too fast! Thank you! Thank God! Thank God! You're gonna kill both of us, oh my God, I'm still alive! The family will make you pay for this! Which family? The Zendako family, you idiot! That's all I wanted to hear. What? Oh shit! CJ finds out that it was the Sindaco family, and he starts planning a heist of Fuzi on the casino. Now, CJ meets Ken Rosenberg for the first time in Don Peyote, after he saves Macker and Kent Paul, and he explains the situation to him. Kent Paul, here to see Rosie. Hey boss, there's somebody here to see you. Oh, go away. I have a migraine. Oh, Rosie, son, it's me, Paolo. Oh, God. My despair is complete. Okay, let him in. Rosie, how are you, me old son? I pray that one day I can escape my perpetual torment and retire in peace and comfort a million miles away from anyone I've ever fucking known, and instead, I get this? Come on, it's me, Kent Poe. Well, hello, Paul. What a pleasant surprise. Who the hell are these guys? These are my boys, Maka and Carl, sir. You want any speckled doves, boss? I'm peeking on one right now. Top of the range, yeah. man. Well, it's fitting as I sit here up to my neck in a river of shit with every mafia gorilla from Liberty City to Los Santos pissing in my face that you, Kent Paul, should witness it. What's the matter, son? Too numerous, oppressively insurmountable, and depressingly fucking typical even to mention. It's all right, bruv. Paolo can help. Give us some space, would you, son? I'll give you a tinkle later. All right, for sure. 
Not you, Macca. <laughs> oh, you twat. Unbelievable. Macker was about to leave with Carl. CJ also reports this immediately to Woozy that he has a way to scope out the casino. Now CJ's gonna call hey, Woozy. Woozy. I think I found a way to scope Caligula's casino without causing too much suspicion. We can talk later. So now CJ has a way into the casino without arousing too much suspicion. He's working directly for Ken Rosenberg. Now once CJ returns to Ken Rosenberg, he explains what's going on with Johnny Sendako. Oi, Rosie, liven yourself up. Carl's here. <sighs> Hello. What's that? Hey, you some top funny down at that pool, pubs, eh? Oh, leave it out, Dimlo. What's wrong with you? Well, are you going to tell him or shall I? I'm really screwed. Crack on, Rosie. Spit it out. I threw it all away. Okay. I had the power, the money, the ladies, but I couldn't lay off the blow. So I went into rehab and everything went to shit, but so what? So when I came out, I started representing the Liberty City mob again. And that's how I ended up here. But no one family would trust another family to run the casino. So I was put forth as a neutral party. So now I spend my days waiting for one family to cap me and blame the other one. My only friend is a bird named Tony. I never fucked anyone over in my life who didn't have it coming to him. Shit, let me think about this. You're going to have to break it down for me real quick. Okay, okay. The Sendakos are on the warpath. Okay? I mean, something terrible like has happened to Johnny. I mean, he's in a shock-induced coma at the hospital across town. Now, the Ferrellis, they will take this opportunity to rub him out. Now, if any hit between the families succeeds on my turf, I will get the axe, bullet, machete, Okay, whatever. okay, relax. I'm going to shoot over to the hospital and move the body or something. There you go, my love. Things ain't so bad, are they? <sighs> Bada bing! So here I am, about to try and rescue some guy that's scared half to death. If he wake up through all this, I'm screwed. If anything was to happen to Johnny, the other families would see it as the other families trying to take over and would kill Rosenberg. This is why CJ has to keep him alive. The Ferrellis see Johnny being moved from the hospital as a perfect time to whack him. They are trying to take over the casino. CJ stops them and he saves Johnny. Hello, sir. Can I help you? Yeah, I'm here to pick up Mr. Sendako. Mr. Sendako? There must be some mistake. An ambulance just picked him up. Oh, okay. Thank you for your help. All right, who's messing with Ferrelli business? Yeah, who's got a death wish? Yeah, you better shut up. Hey, Johnny, how you feeling? I didn't think he was going to be discharged till tomorrow. Now this is the really important part, when CJ and Ken go to see Johnny Sendako. Oh, baby, I'm back! I am back! Let's get this show on the road! The good doctor has revived the patient. Thank you, Sweet thank has my you, son. Thank Sweet. You. So everything's straight now? No! Absolutely not! I'm still screwed! Absolutely screwed, but at least now I'm in the right frame of mind! <laughs> What the fuck are we gonna do? Any minute now, some mafia bullet is going to splatter my brains all over the wall. My wall. My beautiful wall. Ooh, you missed a bit. I love that. Forget about it. Oh, that's a great idea, Tony, but you know what? It ain't gonna work, okay? Not this time. No way, no way. Look, man, relax. Get a grip. Yeah, you're right. I need to get a grip. Take control. Yes, grab the bull by the horn. And show everybody who's boss. I'm the boss. I am the boss. All right, then. All right. Let's tear this That's town up. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> so where we going? Details. Details. Let's just get there. Rack them up, Macca. What's the matter with you? Okay, boss man. Where to? We're going to pay the Sindakos a visit. See how Johnny is. Win him over with some <laughs> kind words during his convalescence. Well, yeah, sure. I can take you by there. Okay, great. We need a car. 
I gotta get out of this game. Shit, my nose is pissing like a racehorse. That is really good stuff. Drive faster, would you please? Come on, come on, come on. What, what are you, an old lady? So you trying to get out? Yes, God, yes. I want to do something safe and legal and boring with people that like me. And have a wife and some kids and get divorced and fight for weekend access like everybody else. Listen, I'll see what I can do. Thanks, I'm just so tired of all this life and death bullshit. <sighs> oh, shit, shit's all down my damn shirt and everything. Uh, it's in my best shirt, too. Doesn't this shirt look good on me? Ken tells CJ that he's trying to get out, and CJ promises that he, him that he will think of something. Now, here's the thing. CJ did a very honorable thing here because he didn't have to do anything for Ken Rosenberg or Kent Paul or Macker. He could have just left them there to get slaughtered by Salvatore, but in the end, he does actually help them escape. Once CJ arrives with Ken, it's very stupid of CJ to go with Rosenberg, but he worries that he will freeze up if he's by himself. Johnny recognizes him as, as heart attack, and all hell breaks, breaks loose. What's going on? Did you forget something? No, nah, look, you go on in, I'm gonna wait. Uh, look, you gotta come with me this once. If I pull this off, I can carry on. I know I can, but please, you gotta come with me. I, I, I'm i gonna squirt my ass all over the floor. Just this once, please, please, please. Okay, please. okay, chill. <laughs> Shit, this can't look good. Listen, everything gonna be okay. Just remember, you the boss. I'm the boss? I'm the boss. I'm the boss. I'm the boss. I am the boss. Hey, boys. Tell your boss that Ken Rosenberg is here to see him. Ken who? K K Ken Rosenberg. <gasps> Ken Rosenberg, the guy that runs this town. So, uh, how's Johnny? Hey, he's doing much better. Huh. Yeah. He ate something this morning. Oh. Huh. Mm -hmm. Hey, Ken. Oh, my Christ, this fucking thing. <laughs> Ken, come on, stay. How you doing? Pretty good. And you? I still got a little bit of the night terrors, a <laughs> touch of diarrhea, but I'll get through it. Huh, diarrhea. Cool. And yeah. uh, who's this? How you doing, Johnny? It's fucking him. It's him. Oh, oh my head. Oh, God. It's him. It oh. My heart... My heart... Damn, that nigga fucked up. So CJ and Ken at this point, they have to get rid of all the witnesses because if anyone survives, Ken is going to be killed. Ken panics also once they're outside. Shit, we gotta get the fuck out of here. We need some wheels. Get me back to Caligula's. You calm down and follow my lead. Holy fuck, man. We work well as a team together, huh, CJ? You and me tearing this town up? Nobody can stop us. Nobody in the world. Johnny's a done deal, and so is his gang. Too fucking right they are, dumb pussies. Oh, fuck, I'm screwed. I'm fucking screwed. What the fuck am I gonna do? Shit, shit, shit! You just gotta hang in there. Play it dumb. I'll figure out a way to get you out of this. Just drop me at the airport. Nah, man. They gotta think you did. I think of something. I promise. CJ is 100% right. Because if Ken flees town right now, the Ferrellis and the Leones will know he possibly had something to do with it, and they'll come after him. They don't care about Johnny. The Ferrellis tried to have him killed themselves, but it's because of the knowledge Kent has on the casino. They will never stop looking for him until he is dead. Salvatore soon arrives back in the city, and he believes the Ferrellis killed Johnny, so CJ is using this to his advantage. Now remember, he has no reason to think CJ had anything to do with this. Salvatore also benefited a lot of Johnny's death because he now owns 50% of the casino, not just 33.3%. The Ferrellis in response want to kill Salvatore because they believe that they may be next on Salvatore's list and to solidify their control over the casino. This is when CJ first meets Salvatore. Hello? Carl, it's me, Ken. The Leone family has made their move. Salvatore's here. Now, he's taken over Caligula's. We're screwed. It's war for control of Venturis, man. War. War. There's word of some triad visit or something that should keep them busy. I'm calling from the bathroom. I gotta go. I really gotta go. Top fucking buzz this. I'm peeking on the blood pressure alone. Yeah, terrific. Well, well, well. What do we got here? Here's your sandwich. 
Who's this pretty thing? I don't usually do this kind of shit, you know. <laughs> I like this girl. What's your name, kid? Maria. And the service is not included. Hey, the woman, you fat fuck! You heard the bird. Come on. <laughs> Are you kidding me? See you later, guys. And who's this asshole? The name's Carl Johnson, sir. Before working with Mr. Rosenberg here, I had the pleasure of doing business with your son, Joey, back in Liberty City. You know my Joey? I like that. So, kid, what can I do for you? Well, Ken, a vouch for me, I'm a straight killer. Oh, but one man fucking army. A, a real dependable. Total fucking maniac, too. You know, the Ferrellis are sending over a crew to hit me. Their flight gets in soon. Traveling is a string quartet. <laughs> I was gonna send some of the boys over as a little welcoming committee. But uh, maybe you can take care of it. Thank you, sir. I guarantee you, you won't regret this. Uh, maybe I should go no! that, 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 Stay where you are, Rosenberg. I don't want you getting yourself lost. Now, why does Salvatore trust CJ exactly? It's because of this scene. Before he came back to Los Santos, CJ stole cars for Joey Leon out of his chop shop. CJ. Yeah, I hear you. I never knew my dad, but my brother used to make my life miserable. Yeah, well, that's what family folk. Anyway, uh, I got that thing you wanted. You want me to shoot it by the garage? Nah, nah, I gotta get this thing off the street, man. It's way hot. All right, cool. Later. This is the same chop shop that we see in GTA 3. Now, Salvatore really has no reason not to trust CJ when you think about it. He's probably called his son Joey after this and asked him, you know this guy? Joey probably said, yeah, he's a good guy. He can get stuff done. He brought me a lot of good cars. Salvatore doesn't believe that CJ will betray him because he thinks he's just some common street fuck for hire. He doesn't think that CJ has the guts to go after him. This is where Salvatore's narcissism comes into play. He thinks he's smarter and better than everyone. He doesn't know about CJ's connections to the vast triad network. The reason he sends CJ over is because he's preparing for a war with the first by sending CJ over, he's not putting any of his guys in harm's way, and he has a backup plan in case CJ failed. There's no way a man like Salvatore doesn't have a backup plan. He probably had a team of hitmen ready at the airport when the Ferrellis landed in case CJ failed. Once CJ eliminates the hitmen on the plane, he sees the potential that CJ has. This is why he sends him over to wipe out the Ferrellis at the St. Mark's Bistro. Just feel the weight of the weapon, sweetheart. <laughs> I can feel the weight of someone's weapon. Hey! You don't want to blame on that front. Can I fucking go now, or fucking what? Ooh, you fucking twat! Right in the fucking happy sack! Perhaps you'll be cured of your little anti-social condition, mate. Carl, my man. Mr. Leon? Looks like this piece of shit was right. You did a real number on those Ferrelli losers. Now it's time the Ferrellis found out what it means to screw with Salvatore Leon. How would you like to hit the St. Mark's Bistro? A hit in Liberty City? Cool. But I'm gonna need some backup. Take who you want. Well, I usually use these two. Hey, hey, remember all those jobs we did together? Huh? Huh? You and me, Carl, remember? Huh? You know, you used to call me Killer Ken. Ken the Killer? Killer? Ice Cold Ken. That's me. And him too, I guess. CJ succeeds and whacks Marco Ferrelli. Now, Marco, I have his face for Red X. He is the brother of Sonny Ferrelli, who took over after Sonny's demise. He is the boss of the Ferrellis in 1992. He was underboss at the time of Vice City. And after this, after he's killed, Franco Ferrelli 
their other brother takes over, who becomes the boss during the events of GTA Liberty City stories. Now, at this point, Salvatore is very happy and very trusting of CJ. He has 100% control of the casino, with both families kicked out of Las Venturas. He calls CJ to congratulate him, and right after that, Woozy calls CJ to let him know that it's on. Hello? Hey, call my boy. Mr. Leone. Everybody's talking about the job you did on that St. Mark's Bistro. Thank you, Mr. Leone. And you, uh, you took care of those three loose ends? Yeah, those poor saps ran into a little trouble along the way. You won't be hearing from Mr. Rosenberg again. Good boy, good boy. Now listen, you're gonna have to keep a low profile or people will start to make connections. So let's keep our distance for a while, huh? I'll call you. Thank you, Mr. Leone. Hello? Hey, CJ, what's up with you? Are we doing this heist or have you gone soft on me again? Hey, check it. Them fools been shipped out of the Venturas. Salvatore think I'm cool, so it's on. I'll meet you back at the Dragons. Okay, cool. Later. So now begins the heist. CJ and his crew plan the heist at Caligula's. CJ has been there several times, so he knows somewhat of the layout, but he has to get the plans for the casino. He has to get some police bikes for disguises, a keycard for Millie, and an armored truck. So begins it all, and it goes mostly smooth, except for the part where Zero brags about it to Berkeley, who notifies the police. CJ and his team successfully knock out the guards, steal the loot in an armored trucks with fake police escort, and CJ flees the casino in a helicopter. Now after this heist, you get this phone call, which started the video. Sup? You two-bit backstabbing piece of eggplant shit! Salvatore! Nice to hear from you too! You're dead! Your friends are dead! Your family's dead! I'm gonna fuck you up and your children and your grandchildren. Well, it's been nice talking to you, but uh, I got some money that needs spending on some expensive trash, so if you excuse me. You're dead! Dead! Now that we have the whole story explained, Salvatore figures out that it was CJ who betrayed him. He wants to have CJ killed, even threatening CJ's family. But here's the big question. Why does nothing happen? Why doesn't he send any guys after CJ? Nothing happens. He doesn't do anything. Well, there's two reasons. Let's start out the first reason, which is the Ferellis and the Sindacos. Why would they prevent Salvatore from killing CJ? It's because they are going after Salvatore right after this heist. There is a war going on in Liberty City at the end of GTA San Andreas. The Sindacos and the Ferellis lost all their money invested in Venturas. Salvatore has no way to pay them off, even if he wanted to, because all of his money is gone. Salvatore lost way more than 5 million, because think about it. All the guys he was paying to protect the casino, as well as all the resources he had to relocate to Venturas. And the Sindacos especially want blood because their boss's son is dead. Even if Salvatore tells them that he didn't start this, it was CJ, no one would believe him. He basically has no time to kill CJ because he's fighting a massive war with the Ferellis and has no resources to send to Venturas. Think about it, not only did he lose all his money, but all his guys defending the casino. This war of the three families lasts until at least 1994, when Tony Cipriani killed a made man in either the Ferelli or the Sindaco family. Now, some people falsely believe that Tony killed CJ, but this makes no sense. Why would he flee Liberty City itself when CJ is on the West Coast? Tony's father knew Salvatore, and so this is why Salvatore made attempts to hide Tony. The guy that Tony killed was probably a very high-ranking Sindaco member. This had to have been either the boss or the underboss. In GTA Liberty City Stories, which takes place in 1998, Tony kills Polly Sindaco. It's believed that Polly is possibly Johnny's father, as he bears similarity to him, but it's entirely possible he's an older brother, and in fact, Tony killed the boss of the Sindaco family. This might have forced the Sindacos to seek peace terms. It's unknown how this war ended exactly, but by 1998, when Tony returns, there's an uneasy peace between the families, and it's clear to Sindacos feel the Leones are weak, and that's why they are dealing drugs, on their territory. So, Vincenzo tells me you're too chicken shit to work your patch. Hey man, I'm no chicken shit. I, uh, I've been ill as all. I'll go back to work tomorrow, uh, maybe the day after. Oh, I think you're gonna work today, like it or not. Oh man, I don't feel too good. I think I might have a fever or something. He's just making excuses, there's a reason for that. Listen, man, I told you, Leone. Tiny Tales don't go for the Leone still. This is Daco's moving in. If I go back there, I'm a dead man. Sure, sure. I'm telling you, man, this is Daco's a dealing. Get any 
piece? I'm already all blocked up. Last thing I need is you on my case. Ah, but as you're still here, you know, I'm still not seeing any money coming in from that dealer. You know why? Enlighten me. Because he's dead, idiot. Some chump whacked him. Sindakos has started dealing. And on Leone Turk, too. You gonna accept that, Tony? I want you to get over to Chinatown. All right, boss. I'm on it. Eventually, these tensions lead to full-scale war with the families in 1998 and another war. The Diablos and the Yakuza and the Triads also join in, jo uh, backed by the Sicilian Mafia. Come siamo rimasti d'accordo. If you do my associates' work for them, you'll be well rewarded. Hepburn Heights will belong to the Diablos. So keep quei bastardi dei Leone tied down in Portland. And when my associates control this city, you'll be taken care of. Ci pensiamo noi. Over there! It's the Leone! The Leones do end up winning in the end in 1998, but at a cost. They stopped the Diablos from pushing into the Red Light District, but they lost Hepburn Heights in the process. The Leones also lost their cash warehouse, which got blown up by the Triads, so though they did salvage some of the cash. The mayor of Liberty City, Roger C. Hull, he was elected in 1992, and the Ferrellis were using him to cause Salvatore tons of legal problems. This is why the police kept investigating him in GTA Liberty City stories and not the Ferrellis. Salvatore had the mayor killed and tried to replace him with Donald Love, but Love lost the election after his ties to the Leones was revealed. O'Donovan took power and was another Ferrelli puppet, but Salvatore got him on his side after he wiped out the Ferrellis in Fort Staunton with a huge bombing and saved O'Donnell from the Sicilians. He also had Tony attack the Yakuza and destroyed their stolen military tank. He had Polly Sindaco killed the boss of the Sindaco family as he tried to flee Liberty City. That's the boss of the Sindakos. Oh, we'll see about that. Okay. <laughs> well, that's it for Polly. So the Sindaco family are finished. Um, that's it for them. Uh, they're not a threat anymore. After Polly Sindaco was killed, the Sindaco family largely fell apart, with what was left relocating to Las Venturas. Franco Ferrelli was killed in the explosion in Fort Staunton, losing hundreds of their own guys. And this became the Ferrelli brothers, which largely collapsed in 2001 in GTA 3. And lastly, Salvatore defeated Massimo, the representative of the Sicilian Mafia in Liberty City at the end of GTA Liberty City stories. Even though the Leones won, and still remained the most powerful family in Liberty City, it came at a huge cost, and they weren't as big as they used to be anymore. Salvatore could not spare any resources searching for CJ because he doesn't want another war, because he barely survived the last two. So basically, he can't touch CJ because he has much more enemies closer to home who pose a direct threat to him. CJ isn't coming after him anymore, just for his casino's money, and so he doesn't have to worry about him trying to kill him. And in GTA 3, what does Salvatore tell Claude about the Colombian cartel? Bomb the base, one of the best missions. Out, but while we're at war with the triads, we ain't strong enough. The cartel has got bottomless funds from pushing that spank crap. If we make an open attack on them, they'll wipe the floor with us. They must be making spank on that big boat that Curly led you to. So we gotta use our heads. Or rather, one head. Your head. I'm asking you to destroy that spank factory as a personal favor to me, Salvatore Leon. If you do this for me, you will be a made man. Anything you want. Go and see 8-Ball. You'll need his expertise to blow up that boat. He says if we openly attack them, they will wipe the floor of him. Even in 2001, he has the problem of the growing Colombian cartel who have flooded Liberty City with Spank and have taken over Fort Staunton. He just has way too many enemies that he doesn't have time nor resources to go after CJ even nine years later. And the second reason that Salvatore doesn't harm CJ, it's the most important one, and it's that he can't. So earlier we said that he has no resources to send to hurt CJ, but he also can't even if he wants to. The reason, it's because of Woozy and Ron Fali. 
Woozy is the leader of the Mountain Cloud Boys of the Triads, and Ron Fa Lee is the leader of the Red Gecko Tong of the Triads. These are two very powerful triad organizations who came together. CJ meets Woozy in the countryside, racing, and quickly develops a fr friendship with him. Woozy is very honest with CJ, never attempts to hide anything from him nor screw him over, and CJ is the same in return. CJ does numerous favors for Woozy, and Woozy considers him a friend and thanks him. Ron Fa Lee, who Woozy brings in, first doubts CJ's capability, but after CJ retrieves a package for him from the airport while being chased by the Nang boys, he grows to respect him. Hey, Woozy, my man. What's going down? Hey, CJ. Let me introduce you to Shuk Fu, Ron Fa Lee. He heads the Red Gecko Tongue on the West Coast. How you doing? Yeah. Mm. Ah Ah Kung has sent word from Kowloon. A Vietnamese crime family, the Da Nang boys, are preparing to move to the United States. This may explain the cowardly attack on the Blood Feather Triad. <coughs> there may be some trouble ahead. <coughs> the Shi Fu would like a package retrieved. A courier has left it in a drop at the airport. It is most important to the matter at hand. Oh, I can do that. Huh? <laughs> he is Triad? A mountain boy? No, a personal friend of mine. And less likely to draw the attention of the Danang boys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for your support. But what gains Ron Fa Lee's trust the most is when CJ saves his life. The Da Nang boys, a Vietnamese rival gang, are trying to kill Ron Fa Lee. He can't leave Woozy's betting shop or he will be killed. So CJ suggests a very smart plan. As honored as I am to share my home with you, we should lure these lizards out into the baking sun. <laughs> we were followed here. The Da Nang boys are watching this apartment. As soon as we leave, they will attempt an assassination. Hey, what's the big deal? Won't you cruise on out of here, lead them to a place quiet, and cap they flat asses? No offense. None taken. <laughs> we find you funny. Tch, look, long as they think Mr. Farley here is in the back, they'll follow me wherever. After a while, you can come out safely. Simple. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Your success will be rewarded. Mr. Johnson. CJ puts himself in harm's way while leading the Nang boys out of town. Ron Fali was able to escape due to this. Hey. Mr. Johnson, it's Guppy. Are you okay? Yeah, it's nothing. They took the bait like morons. Mr. Ron Fali, get out all right? Yes, Woozy has taken him to safety. Thank you. Cool. I'll see you later, man. It's decoy! Back to Chinatown! Ron Fali owes CJ from this. And from what we have seen, he's a very honorable man, just like Woozy, who keeps his word. This is why Ron Fali is perfectly fine with CJ receiving one third of the Four Dragons Casino, because CJ proved himself and saved his life. Mr. Ron Fali. <laughs> Gentlemen? Can I have your marks, please? Gentlemen, or shall I say partners? Mm. Oh, I drank to that. If any harm came to CJ, even if Salvatore tried his best, like made it look like some kind of car accident hit, everyone would know Salvatore did it. This is exactly the reason why CJ isn't scared of Salvatore and mocks him, because he knows Salvatore is screwed. Ron Fali, because he owes CJ, will mess Salvatore up, and so will Woozy. And do I think the Triads could kill Salvatore? Yes, I do. Not alone, but with all the wars he had in Liberty City, and the, the Triads, they would be the killing blow. And we know the Triads have massive resources because of when they send a team to wipe out the local syndicate because they hated crack, 
and to help CJ. They also sent a massive, almost paratrooper-like invasion to attack a Mad Dog's house in Los Santos and cleared the entire mansion of drug dealers. Their combat skills show they are very professional gangster soldiers. They definitely would have the resources to send multiple teams to kill Salvatore in Liberty City. But why don't they just attack him and kill him right away? It's because there's no need to. They aren't attacking Salvatore anymore. They just sent, sent a clear message. Las Venturas is our territory, and Salvatore isn't sending people after them. There's no need to send guys over and put them in harm's way. Salvatore gets the message, and he's dealing with other crap there. With all the resources Salvatore has, he definitely would have found out how CJ pulled off the heist, and when he saw the triads were involved, he backed out and he took the loss. But here's the thing, the most important reason that the Triads would kill Salvatore if he harmed CJ isn't because of them owing CJ necessarily, that's part of it, sure, but it's because CJ is their friend, and that is the reason why the Four Dragons succeeded where Caligula's failed. The deal the three families had in Caligula's was to work together and make a ton of money, but they didn't do that. They instead kept trying to screw each other over and get the advantage over each other. They had no loyalty or honor between each other. They were never friends, where in the Four Dragons Casino, everyone was friends. Woozy, Ron Fali, and CJ, and they all worked together to get rich. They wouldn't have been able to pull off that heist if they didn't work together. They weren't trying to screw each other over and were honorable amongst each other. Look at Caligula's. They all kept trying to screw each other over, and because of that, they didn't see the bigger threat, which was from the outside, until it was too late. The Forellis, the Sindacos, and the Leonis all deserved what they got for their greed. Simply being friends and not fighting each other is what gave the Four Dragons the clear advantage over the families. The enemy of my enemy is not my friend, and Salvatore learned that really quickly by working with CJ. And lastly, one important detail that I want to discuss at the end here is how CJ's betrayal broke and destroyed Salvatore. It didn't just destroy him financially, but psychologically. Salvatore was never the same again after CJ's betrayal. This caused Salvatore to go into a deep sense of paranoia that haunted him until the end of his life nine years later. Nothing hurts a narcissist like Salvatore more, someone who thinks they are better and smarter than everyone, than having their own ego destroyed. The ironic thing about this is Salvatore went into this thinking he holds all the cards, and he thought he was playing everyone, he thought he was manipulating the chessboard while the Forellis and the Sindacos were fighting, but in reality, he was the one himself who also got played. Salvatore's paranoia would be a huge trigger of events later in his life, and his ultimate downfall. First, even though Tony had massive history of him, his father knowing Salvatore and helping to end the mob war of 1994, he fully doesn't trust Tony, and he appoints Vincenzo to watch him. Hey, hey, hey. So there he is, huh? Hey. <laughs> so listen, Tony, I know you did a good thing first, and I know you've been lying low for a long time. So I want you to take it easy for a while, huh? Vincenzo will look after you. You need some money? Ask him. You need a job? Lucky he'll take care of you. What more could a family guy ask for? Even my son done got it so good. But, Mr. Leone, I thought we got history. I mean, I've done a lot for this family. And now you're expecting me to take orders from this, this, this... Well, it just doesn't seem right. Tony, I know what you did, and no one is more grateful than me, honestly. But the idea that you walk in here and start to question my leadership right away is, quite frankly, out of order. Kabish. I understand, boss. So when you need something, give Vincenzo a call down at Atlantic Key. He'll take care of you. Won't you lucky? Of course, boss. Anything you say. Tell you what, we can go there now. Now this scene is actually set up pretty well. Um, notice how Salvatore actually looks at Tony right here in that scene. It's because Salvatore is extremely paranoid. That's probably why he doesn't uh, he doesn't give Tony that much respect right when he comes back because he doesn't know what Tony's been up to those several years. We got you a nice little place to stay, Tony. It's got you written all over it. We'll head there first. I hate Vincenzo so You're much. Hard. This is it, Tony. Home sweet home. Beautiful, ain't she? This shithole is supposed to be my home? Oh, I think it's very you. Now you're disrespecting old Vincenzo. Now, tough guy, get your ass upstairs and go put on some decent clothes. I don't got all day, so move. Salvatore later betrays J.D. O'Toole after J.D. helped him with so much information, even telling Tony about his kidnapping and about how the Forellis were trying to take over the Red Light District. To be fair, J.D. was a scumbag, but he helped Salvatore out so much, and Salvatore still had him killed. Hey, are we there? Uh, where's Salvatore? Tony, the first drink's on me. Ah, uh, yeah, about that. Hey, the 
guy was a fucking rat. He screwed over his own boss, the scratchy eye. Salvatore could never have trusted that motherfucker. Dump the fucking car on the river. You could drive me off on the way. There are other reasons that Salvatore had him killed, like the fact that he betrayed his own family, the Sindacos, but even Tony was shocked by it, as he thought JD would get made. It was Salvatore's main paranoia that caused him to kill JD. I did an entire lore video on this event, if you want to check it out, it's in my lore playlist. Salvatore even shows how paranoid he is, questioning Tony. Well, well what? Don't play dumb with me, kid. I was playing dumb when your mother was still turning tricks. What's your problem? I know what you've been saying about me. You think I'm an idiot? Huh? Is that what you think? Boss, I ain't been saying nothing about you. What the fuck? I don't know what's happening to me. Jesus, I'm getting paranoid, Tony. Really fucking paranoid. Just because I think everyone hates me doesn't mean they don't. Know what I mean? Someone is out to get me. It's that fucking mayor. He's gonna blame me for all this shit that's been going down in the neighborhood. All of it. Not just the crap that I did, but all of it. Come on, let's go take care of this. Salvatore even screwed Tony over after everything he did for him, not even giving him the full million he promised despite saving his life numerous times. So, we are at peace now. You and the old country. Of course, me and all my people. Good, very good. Sneaky little bastard. I wouldn't trust him a fucking inch. <laughs> Every dog has his day. He says the same line from Scarface there. Yeah, but we did it. Yeah, we cleaned up. <laughs> you did good, Tony. You did real good. I always knew you was a good kid. You saved my ass a few times, and I appreciate that kind of loyalty. Thank you. A good worker? I like that. Respectful. So I got you that half million I promised you. Half? Ooh, I thought you, uh, said a couple. <laughs> I said one million dollars. For what? You can put a price on friendship? The kind of friendship you and me have? Shame on you. Come here. You're a good kid. <laughs> but shame on you. CJ destroyed Salvatore's mental state. Salvatore was always a narcissistic scumbag, but CJ made him a paranoid wreck. When I was in elementary school in the early 2000s, I had a Game Boy Advance SP. I was so happy with it. Then one day, some kid from my class stole it uh, from the coat rack. I never got it back. It was lost forever. And that one event, even though it was over 20 years ago, changed me forever. I was never the same again. And I always worried that someone was going to take my phone or my wallet, and I always triple check where all my stuff is because of that event. I am still to this day worried that if I don't triple check on all my stuff, it's going to be gone. But that was just a Game Boy. I can't imagine what losing over $5 million, dozens of your guys in a casino would do to someone's mental state. This is why CJ ultimately was the one who killed Salvatore, not Claude. Salvatore betrayed Claude because he was getting very paranoid and because Maria told him she and him were having an affair. Maria is an idiot. Salvatore knows that. I highly doubt that that was just the reason that he betrayed Claude. Salvatore knows how much nonsense Maria pulls. I have a lore video on this and how Salvatore betrayed Claude in my lore playlist as well. Salvatore betrayed Claude because he was an outsider, and he was not going to take a chance on him like he did CJ, even though Claude had no intention of betraying him at that time. Salvatore even intimidated Tony, the one guy who was loyal to him. Earlier, um, when Tony had his whole maid ceremony, Tony never betrayed Salvatore, yet that whole ceremony when he was being made was to make it look like JD's ceremony before his death. Salvatore even brought in Mickey, his personal hitman. He was there for a reason, to scare and intimidate Tony. Tony, a few of the guys will be calling you later. Make sure you're around when they arrive. Ciao, Salvatore. So this is the mission where Tony gets made. Hey, he becomes Tony, an official member in. of the Mafia. Come on, we're going for a ride. Come on, get in, you're driving. Mickey, what, uh, what's up? Come on, Cipriani, what, what do you think, I'm here to whack you? It's a lot of signs Salvatore that you're possibly getting in. betrayed. I mean, look, you, you, Salvatore's personal hitman, Mickey, shows up, sits in the back seat behind you. Hold on to me, what are you waiting for? 
and on top of that, you know, they have you go to this alley where they're watching both sides to tell you to go down here. It makes it seem like Tony's gonna get betrayed. Tony, my boy, today's the day you're being made. Oh, Salvatore, I miss the Leone. Our mama's been waiting for this day. This is the type of person Salvatore is. Even the guy who is completely loyal to him, he screws him over. And Salvatore paid for it in the end. He deserved what he got for being a narcissistic, paranoid wreck that he is. He couldn't hurt CJ because of CJ's connections and his war with the families. If Salvatore wasn't greedy and trying to screw everyone over, maybe it would have ended differently. But what CJ did to him, is that really any different than what he was doing to the Sindakos? Sure, they weren't their friends, but he never went into the deal being an equal partner. He was going to screw them. Thank you guys for watching this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I wanted to make a video on Salvatore and this specific event because I've actually seen a lot of comments asking me why Salvatore didn't do anything. So I hope this finally cleared up the confusion. If you did enjoy the video, do drop a like. It helps me to make more content like this. And I will see you guys on the next one. Take care, everyone, and have a wonderful day, guys.